Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Hertzer, a Bloomberg News reporter. I get I cover farming from seed uh, to final food product, from sort of all the individual farmers to the biggest global companies in the world. And we're visiting with a lot of interesting people today in the ag tech industry. Um, I'm excited to host ag tech, the role of green tech in, in the new green world. Today, we'll examine how decision makers in ag tech industry are utilizing technology to give businesses and society new tools to tackle the most perplexing climate issues. Whether it's smart farming to enhance the quality of food or utilizing ag tech to monitor crop growing cycles, innovation is impacting every aspect of our global economy and our personal lives. How will climate change exacerbate the food crisis as the global population grows and how can agriculture rise to the challenge of feeding the world while minimizing the environmental impact? What are the immediate green pressure points farmers face from limited water availability to runoff penalties? And what goals are coming out of COP26? These are just some of the things we'll uh, talk about today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping Notes, if Zoom crashes, close and reopen the application, refresh your browser if you're having any connectivity issues, and close all applications to reserve bandwidth. And click the raised hand icon when uh, you want to weigh in. And there's a chat box on the side as well. Most importantly, I want to thank our sponsor, IEDC, for helping make this virtual roundtable possible today. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Mitch Frazier, Chief Executive Officer of Agrinovis Indiana, who will say a few words. Michael, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for bringing together leaders all across the world and all across this economy to have a discussion that is, is incredibly important. It's certainly important to us here in Indiana for our state, for our country, and I think for our future. Our state, is home to a $52 billion ag bioscience economy. I, I love your, your positioning, Michael, from seed to storefront. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but we look at the ag biosciences economy much in the same way here in Indiana. Everything from value-added food and nutrition to animal health to crop protection and plant science and to ag tech and every place in between. And when we look here in Indiana specifically, we look at that coupled with what we see as a, a real rising strength in software as a service or B2B SaaS and our strength in manufacturing and logistics as real catalyst to shape this next chapter of innovation in the ag biosciences. And I think the discussion we're about to have today really highlights that collaboration and will create opportunities for us to, to reimagine how we can work together not just here in Indiana, not just here in the US, but all around the world to address the future of the ag biosciences. I look forward to today's conversation, Michael. I sincerely appreciate everything you've done, the team at Bloomberg have done to make this possible. And I'm confident that together, we can identify opportunities to work together, to collaborate, to innovate, and ensure the food system we rely on every day is sustainable and meets the needs of populations around the world. Michael, I, I really look forward to today's conversation. Thanks again. Thank you, Mitch. So to sort of kick off some uh, kick off the discussion, we have a few thought starters. First one is the pace of change is incredibly fast today, and businesses' ability to ad adapt is essential. How are we managing these new demands, and specifically, is the supply chain sort of impeding that at all? Anyone like to weigh in? We can give this to Mitch for the, the first question, if, if that's easiest. Well, I, I can make it. Lizzie? Sure, no, I was, I, I was just going to say, yeah, the supply chain is it's, um, it's an interesting thing. I always look at the supply chain as, because it's so fragmented and so vast, you know, and it goes right, right through from, you know, the the, the, the cropping input manufacturers, the animal health pharmaceutical manufacturers, all the way through you know, distribution and different forms of uh, farming, and then a myriad of food processing down to retail. There are many little supply chains here. And so the, the, 
the vast nature of the participants, and then you add this sort of regional and global dimension to it, means that you're not really ever talking about one supply chain. And so when you talk about the technologies and the collaboration that's required to get, you know, those those seamless data exchanges, those 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 business insights from the analytics of those data sets, you're you're really talking about a, a huge structural problem within the the agri food industry, um, to be able to just do the basics sometimes, which is to have, you know, one data set interact with another data set to create something something quite meaningful. So that this is this is the opportunity really here for for the ability to to take what vast amounts of data are currently being generated already and make sense of them and then apply some of these new and emerging technologies to to to, to enhance that. That's great. Um, looks like uh, Eric Eric is uh, wanting to weigh in. Yeah, to just talk about the bigger picture, I thought like it's a good start. <laughs> I come from a, a hexagon, which is a world leader when it comes to more of measurement technology. So we have a lot of things in agriculture, but I thought like on the bigger picture, the earth has existed 4.3 billion years roughly. And uh, if we squeeze that into 365 days, human being has only existed 23 minutes and we have consumed 30% of all available resources on this planet. That's amazing how we have scaled, but we haven't scaled sustainable. And now the reason why I think we are all here is that we want to continue to have our GDP growth and have our population growth, but we need to get that in a sustainable way. And to chime in what Michael just said there, if we can get the data in motion, if we are really getting out 10 or maybe even 100 times more data, we should be able to be 10 or even 100 times more, much more efficient. And that's how we, from our perspective, contribute. But we want to work with all of you guys across the whole agriculture industry to really make put this data into motion. We can know where things are down to two centimeters. You know the industry. I think we can do much more together. So that was just to chiming in on, on Michael's point on we have data, but we need to get it into motion. Thank you so much. And, and Allison uh, wanted to, to weigh in as well. Yeah, I wanted to add that one of the interesting dynamics that we see, at least in the horticulture industry, which is where, where we're based, is that you have also the, the rise of square footage in our industry as it continues to grow and grow, um, but there, you're not having an introduction of new types of workers yet. You're having an aging worker population. You've got growers who have to take on more and more and more responsibility over an increasing square footage with less resources, right? And so that creates this really unique opportunity for technology. Uh, and for automation and all of the types of the things that we're seeing, which is why that pace is growing so quickly. Um, but where, where I get really optimistic is when you look at the supply chain and the value chain here, we don't have unlimited players in agriculture, right? And a lot of industries, they have thousands and thousands of people in every step of the way. We've got input companies, distributors, agronomy, growers, and technology companies. And that's sort of it at a high level. And when you look at even in those categories, you don't have thousands of people. You have tens of companies in each of those categories, which creates a really unique opportunity for what Eric is talking about, what Mitch was talking about, what uh, in, his, in his intro, right? What everybody's been talking about with this data challenge of getting data in in throughout all these stages, now is the opportunity for companies to work together, to partner, to find ways to connect these technologies, to get a fully integrated solution and offering to growers and to farmers back so that we can kind of work together to solve these problems. In the past, it's been a little bit closed, right? We've been trying to figure this out at the same time, working in silos. Uh, we're at this unique turning point where we don't have to do that anymore because technology can be bought off the shelf and works. That's a really good point. And, and uh, Cecile looks like she's she's waiting to, to speak as well. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm representing Geosis, uh, which is the Ag Division from Earth Daily Analytics. And I just wanted to share that uh, there is a more and more uh, societal demand for more sustainable food. And supply chain is about having an overall overview from uh, growing crops to food companies transforming the crops into foods. And there is a need for traceability systems to enable uh, this visibility about how the crops have been grown. And there's a need for more collaboration between the different players. Like with satellite imagery, we can monitor how the crops have been grown 
and so interconnect uh, the different parts of the chain through traceability system is a real uh, opportunity for people to have more visibility on how the crop crops are grown. Thank you. And uh, it does look like everybody and wants to wants to address this this first topic, which is wonderful. Um, Lice, would you like to speak next? Yes, and thank you. Me? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm representing Solinftech here, uh, which is an ag tech founded 15 years here, uh, ago here in Brazil and have been expanding in countries in Latin America and also in the US. And, and so if that, uh, one of the challenges we face in agriculture in collecting data, as we are talking here, is it's, agriculture is an analog, analogic sector. So digitalizing that sector is a challenge for us. Uh, and here in Brazil, we don't have 3G, 4G infrastructure. So that was a huge challenge to collect real-time data and give back to the growers a more precise decision in terms of what to do, when to do with all the resources and inputs involved in the production process inside the farm. Uh, so that's, that's something we've been growing, uh, expanding here in the country. And we believe that with data and with AI algorithms and softwares, uh, we are able to give back 20, 30% reduction in machinery needed uh, inputs, pesticides, fertilizers, and that's one of the biggest challenges we need to answer for the planet, right? And how we can do more with less. The resources of the planet are limited, and we have a growing demand of the growing population uh, that we need more food uh, in, the, in the future years. So through data and technology and with precision agriculture, we can have an incremental change. Of course, we also need transformational changes that will reduce much more the inputs and resources needed, but that's a, a start, and that's where Solinftech have been working with. Thank you. And uh, Jocelyn? All right. Yeah, quickly, we, we, I'm with Hortel, we're a Canadian uh, company. We're doing IoT, connecting soil and plants, you know, to uh, manage in real time and anticipate uh, the conditions, you know, to adapt and uh, create, create, you know, more uh, sustainability and profitability for the farmers. Uh, as far as the, that supply chain and that integration, it's a, it's a very interesting topic because it's been around forever in, in ag tech, and I think there's a, there's never been a better time. And as we move forward, there's going to be more integration, and that's 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 you know the potential is huge. Now, the one thing I think if we look at the past though is to be very careful not to uh, integration is important, but providing specific solution to specific issues you know one at a time is is very important as well sometimes that the ag tech sector has uh you know not always done a good job for good and bad reasons you know on that of, of really knowing exactly what problem we're trying to solve uh the big picture is super important but we'll we'll get there you know one step at a time so uh i think that's important in that conversation because it's uh uh, the supply chain is complex. The, the diversity is very uh, high. You know, I cannot imagine another industry with more diversity of, uh, of crops, of climates, of growing conditions. So, um, I I think the angle of uh, and I, I'm sure that's no everyone here uh, realizes that. But for for someone that's uh, looking at it a little more from the outside, you know, trying to trying to find a blanket solution, you know, and uh, I don't think that applies very well. So, so, and it's it's a complex uh, balancing act, I would say, to to have the set of solution that works together, but that that still solve each you know specific issue in the best way possible, the most efficient way possible. Thanks, Jocelyn. I think that that sort of sets sets up our our next topic uh, pretty well. You know, we're well aware of sort of problems in the supply chain, finite resources, whether it's water or crop nutrients and or the number of workers that you can bring onto your farm or or in, in your factory. Um, would anyone like to, to tell us about how technology is kind of working into your own personal workflow or, or maybe something that your your company has has developed to improve um, in that realm? Just basically how how technology helps you do your job today. Um, 
Allison. Yeah, so I can get us kicked off. I, I, a lot of this philosophically to me comes with starting to understand what's actually happening on the farm. Um, and so it's, you know, a few folks on this call have already kind of hit on this a little bit of farming is a really analog industry. We haven't had a digital record of everything that's happening on the farm kind of to date, right? Software in this space really only got started in 2009 and in certain segments of the industry really in 2015 and 16. And so you're starting to see this next phase of we've got the base layer of information starting to come into digital form for the first time. And so the company that I founded uh, seven years ago-ish, uh, Artemis, that's what we did, right? We built this um, B2B software that uh, started to understand what's happening in the horticultural operation from labor to operational uh, information to production information to crop information, things that used to be pen and paper heavy, manual heavy, bring them into digital so you can start to understand what you're actually doing. Um, then the next step, and so this is where our company recently was acquired by Unu, uh, another company in this sort of more AI upstream side of technology, is you can can start to implement computer vision and camera technology to see what's going on in the farm. So you get this complete feedback loop of not just what's happening or what you think should happen on the farm, but what actually is happening, what happened. And then you can start to steer that proactively forward. So we can see, you know, when you're at risk for chlorosis or if you've got a pest issue that's coming up, you can start to steer what you do to mitigate those types of things. But you can also steer what you're doing to get the best and highest quality crop or best and highest yield coming out of the facility um, with little tweaks that are driven by not just human thinking, but also human thinking coupled with artificial intelligence. When you can start to do that, then you come back to your question around um, how do you do more with less resources? Because then you can start steering, well, what am I trying to do in an autonomous concept of a facility? Well, I'm trying to produce the most I can at the highest quality as often as I can with the least resources. And that question becomes a really interesting one where you start to tackle it at, at the top of just more yield, right? And ag as an industry has done that. We've kind of really capped out what we can produce from a volume standpoint. So then you come to quality. Okay, have we capped that out yet? Probably not. There's still room to grow on quality, I think we'd all probably say. Then you come down to uh, as often as you can. Well, that's where systemic change like indoor ag comes into play because you get more cycles and then less resource, which becomes things like how do you tie in irrigation and climate control and lighting and all, all the type of things on the farm. When you start to get that optimized picture of one individual farm, you can then zoom out to systemic change. You can then think about supply chain dynamics and logistics and how close are you producing to your uh, consumer. So it all comes together, but that's sort of what we offer in the market, which is sort of everything from consulting and agronomy up to software and operational software up through artificial intelligence and computer vision technology. That's great. Um, Mitch, do you want to jump back in here? Yeah, happy to. And uh, Allison, totally agree. I mean, where, where Allison highlighted, I think, is what we're seeing macro across the market. And we see it at, at every chapter of the economy. So we certainly see it in production agriculture. We've seen John Deere make big moves, uh, certainly in 2018, if memory serves correctly, when they acquired Blue River Technologies, the idea of being able to, to go through a field using AI, using vision, being able to spot a weed and spray the weed. We saw it just months ago when John Deere made the move to acquire Bear Flag Robotics, really saying, how do we use the technology that Allison just talked through? And, and how do we begin to tackle some of these challenges that have historically been thought of as, as labor challenges, i.e. how do we make sure we have enough people on the farm to, to drive the tractor? How do we use technology to solve that and then free up that human capital to go do really innovation, really innovative things. We see it in animal health where we're seeing a tremendous amount of innovation being put into both the, the biotech side of how do we use microbiome innovation to really think about methane reduction? How do we think about feed optimization and reduction of methane? I, I think all of these pieces highlight there's no one single silver bullet and there's opportunity across this multivariate equation that we call the food system for a lot of innovation to happen. I think the, the other piece that I would highlight here, Michael, as we think through the application of technology and how do we think through it, it's really critical that we don't become 
a focus group of one, right? It's so easy for us to say in our world, hey, we, we think this needs to happen or that needs to happen, or to Allison's point, we need to optimize for this variable. I think that's so important in the world that we're solving for. But we also have to remember there is an emerging world that that simply needs calories. And so as we look at this equation, I think it's really important that we think through there are multiple chapters of this story, there are multiple levels of this activity, and innovation will occur in each one of those chapters and each one of those levels. That's a really good point, Mitch. I think, you know, we are starting to see, you know, these things to to nip around the edges and and I was sort of wondering when we might see like a sea change of of efficiency on the farm and um, I think we're we're getting to that level where we might really start to notice. Um, Lindsay, would you like to to jump in here? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think you were asking at the start there um, about what's holding us back. I think I think well at Pro Agrica, we you know we serve a whole series of um, of players. You know. Mostly in upstream and midstream, you know, that, that including the including the farmers with a variety of uh, data generating solutions, um, advisory solutions, um, you know, some some uh, connectivity solutions. The point I'd like to make is one of the things that I think um, we need to um, take in, into account is when we talk about collaboration, we talk about data sharing, and this 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 wonderful vision that we have about the industry all marching in step because of you know these common data standards that are being shared up and down. Trust is a big blocker. Uh, we, we, we find that, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's natural, right? I mean, you've got farmers that don't want to reveal too much um, about what's going on on farm because they don't want to be price takers in the future. And there are certain people they are more comfortable sharing data with. So one of the things that we try to do is, is we try to facilitate data sharing between those trusted relationships that currently exist, whether that's between you know, a crop farmer and their agronomic advisor, or whether that's between um, uh, livestock uh, producers and uh, corporate vet groups, and um, and and you know, and and that relationship that those corporate vet groups might have with um, with with pharmaceutical companies, and it's really about not betraying that trust, being able to really ensure that our customers understand that data is shared in an appropriate and a permissioned way. And that it's handled by by an independent third party. Now we happen to be an independent third party, We're not the only one out there, I'm sure. But um, but I think the way that the future needs need, needs to work is clearly more collaboration, clearly more data sharing. But we must all, also always bear in mind that those those naked commercial pressures that that are out there need to be uh, respected and and taken into account when we try to come up with the mechanisms by which that data is shared up and down the supply chain. Yeah, that's no doubt and obviously a very sensitive subject um, that's uh, continuing to have to walk that delicate line of helping a farmer, but also not, uh, you know, being too, yeah. too uh, open with their data. Um, yeah. Eric, would you, is that something that, that you are uh, addressing as well? Yeah, I'm, I can concur with everything that has been said already. But if I take it on a journey on five fingers here, the first one is data collection, which has been on for a long time in agriculture. We have been there, been exposed for the first ones out to get data, and it's all about trust. But that is basic; it has to be there. The second level now is precise positioning, and we can get down, and we are around centimeter positioning to know exactly where we have done fertilizing and where we can reduce now a lot of waste and increase the efficiency. The third layer then is when you start to get into full autonomy. And uh, it's actually the tractors and uh, the supporting gears in the agriculture that is really moving furthest ahead, while uh, the consumer side is actually lacking behind because of yeah the type of regulations that is in that area. So John Deere and others, they're really leading the pack here. And we are excited from an Hexcom perspective how close we can work on ensuring that uh, we get full autonomy with that accurate positioning. And then when you have that, then you can get into this perception-based uh, accurate measurement that you have more advanced analytics knowing exactly if it's a dog or if it is what type of uh, a crop is there. Like 
it's quite exciting. But when all this comes together with sensors and software, that's what we define as the smart digital reality. And uh, so far, already, thanks to the technology that we and a lot of others here at the call are providing, I think from our perspective, we have managed to cut now virtualize it with 40%, thanks to a very accurate positioning. And fuel saving that I think it got the number 190 million uh, tons of fuels has been reduced thanks to advanced technology. So despite, I know from an agriculture perspective, it feels like there have been guinea pigs for technology for a long time, but you start to reap the benefits and it's really happening right now. It's like a ketchup effect. That's amazing. I know that with fertilizer prices being record high, any savings there will be extremely big uh, this coming crop year. Um, Cecile, would you like to, to address this? Yes, I agree with uh, everything that's being said. Uh, we were talking about uh, agronomists and uh, farmers' efficiency. And obviously, a farmer or an agronomist cannot uh, go and have a tour on each of the fields every day. So that's where technology can provide uh, accurate measurement every day to agronomists and farmers so they can take insightful decisions based on real observation of what's happening on the field. And for example, Earth Daily Analytics is going to launch uh, a constellation of satellites in 2023 enabling to take daily measurement at five meter resolution every day. So it's going to be possible for agronomists and farmers every day to receive information on each of their fields for all of their farms and uh, spot anomalies, detect changes. Is there a disease appearing in the field? Uh, how should I apply my inputs uh, the appropriate way, depending on the viability of my field? So all of that is going to be possible thanks to uh, technology. That kind of dovetails into the to the next topic a little bit, and and this is something that everyone who's already speaking about is you know obviously this information is useful to farmers because that can directly allow them to improve their fields. But how do you all sort of make sure you're capturing that technology or uh, being sensitive enough, um, but at the still time? Uh, value, getting that value of it for your own business. Anyone want to weigh into that? Jocelyn? Yeah, for uh, for us, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're in the question, you have the angle a little bit of data integration and, uh, and on the previous question, workflow. And I think the value is is there. You know, your 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 uh, it's it's been very tight with the the workflow of the farmer, whichever part of the chain I actually you're 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 taking uh, part of. On our case, in our case, it's it's fuel production, and uh, uh, to the example of uh, of Mitch, you know, with John Deere, and uh, it's an example where one can relate to. But it's I think that knowledge of of the workflow of the farmer. And understanding their day-to-day -day reality, and, and Cecile uh, touched that too with that uh, the remote sensing data at higher resolution. If you combine that better data, better quality data that we, we we're able to get every year, you know, every step of the way. In our case, it's soil data. We combine it with satellite. We combine it with weather forecast and uh, everything that's relevant to us. We keep adding, but with the goal of helping farmers with that workflow. Uh, integrating that information again to create create value, tangible value for the farmer and for the environment at the same time, and that's that's the beauty of technology. I think here of the digital uh, revolution in ag. There's there's been different stages of uh, technology implementation in ag, from from mechanization to uh, chemicals, the green revolution. I mean, we've all seen it going, but uh, digital is the next stage it's probably a little more complex the more complex of all i guess because of that integration and the, the complexity of farming itself but it's a green technology by definition it's uh it's not applying something more it's it's using better using what we have and uh integration again and uh, that workflow the knowledge of the, the farmer's workflow and where exactly we can create value then becomes critical to, to leverage uh, technology in the best uh, the best way Thanks. Um, 
It looks like Lice wants to speak. I, I know me in particular, Brazil is, is kind of like one of the most fascinating places right now. And obviously in the, in the midst of a growing season, um, would love to hear her jump in. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, one of the challenges, as we mentioned here today, is the connectivity, because without real-time data, it's almost impossible to deliver meaningful results to the farmers. So, so Linktech has developed a proprietary solution uh, for connectivity as a mean to an end for us, of course, to deliver uh, decisions, software is our end uh, goal with our clients. Uh, but we needed to develop that, and now we can. We are able to expand operations to the most remote regions here, in, not in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but as I mentioned, us also in Latin American countries. And uh, as an example here, uh, so Linktex is covering now in real time more than 25 million acres. So every day we collect amount, lots of data uh, from the field and we give back uh, the decisions using all the machinery data, microclimate data. We also have partners for uh, satellite imagery. And I think the collective action here is really important. That's why we are all here together. Uh, there is no silver bullet here. So we need to act together and partnerships will be really important to deliver meaningful results to, to farmers. And, and, and that's something we've been doing so far uh, to, to agriculture in Brazil, but also expanding globally. Thanks. I know that the, the recently passed infrastructure bill in the US does include some further funds for broadband internet, which uh, still is, is a major issue in just getting that total connectivity. Um, Allison, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I love this question. So at the heart, right, this is about you. We're all talking about collecting data. We all collect data in some way, shape or form. And then the question becomes, well, what do the companies do with it? And how do we build that trust throughout the supply chain? And, uh, and what value can we create? Right. And so uh, for us as a company, uh, we have a little bit of a luxury in that we're in the controlled environment ag space. We work with greenhouses, we work with indoor ag uh, producers. And so when you think about a lot of the challenges that field ag has had for so long in this space, uh, it's things like internet connectivity, it's things like seasonal production. So you're only getting so much data per cycle per year, right? Um, we're collecting data literally every single day on a new cycle um, for some of our crops. And so we get potentially 365 different data points on crop cycles uh, every single year, uh, which is the most frequent you can get, of course, but uh, we can get a whole swath of information. And so from uh, Uni's perspective, we've got everything from how a crop was planted, where it was, what happened to it, what treatment did it get, what cycling did it get, all of the workflow things, labor, uh, who touched what, when, compliance, food safety. We've got uh, climate information because we have sensing technology. We have vision information so we can see everything. You've got uh, connectivity through APIs to the climate control irrigation. So we know all of the information that touches a plant at all during its entire cycle. Um, and so then it becomes a question of, well, what do you do with this information, right? And the first step is you have to provide immediate value to uh, the customer, right? And uh, and I think when it comes to trust, standards are great. We need standards. We do need to understand how data is going to move through the supply chain, who it's going to benefit from it. Um, but to, to farmers at the end of the day, Trust is earned through action. We need to show what we're doing with information and show the value that we're creating. So if I can get a farmer 10% profit margin bump because of workflow improvements based on that, they're going to pay for it. They're going to use that system. Um, and similarly, we start thinking about the broader implications in the supply chain of where can this information be really valuable back to the grower uh, by using it somewhere else, right? So we've started to launch some project finance offerings with some lenders in the ag space because we can paint a picture of risk on the farm. And so we can then go to project finance partners and say, look, we know exactly who's going to expand, when they're going to expand, what it's going to cost and what the risk profile looks like. Can you get them better rates on their financing? And so we can start to monetize against that, but growers are benefiting because they're getting more affordable debt, which right now is the best thing they can do to their profit margin on that farm uh, for the next 10, 20 years. And so there are other areas like that I think probably we're all thinking about, whether it's input providers or marketplace opportunities, whether it's output and where product is going, it's pricing, it's futures markets, it's all of these types of things that can ultimately benefit somebody. But you have to show that. You have to show that you're not taking advantage of the information to make a farmer 
a price taker, right? And so uh, to somebody's point earlier, and and the more that we can show that and not just talk about it, uh, which is what we've done for a long time now, I think that's going to be what really moves the needle forward for data and how data flows through the supply chain. That's really good. Obviously, that's pretty tangible when you're actually there at the bank and, and seeing maybe some more favorable terms based on practices. Um, can't get better than that. Um, Cecile? Yes, farmers and agronomists have to take uh, hundreds of uh, decisions every year. And there are as much uh, solution, you know, ag tech solution as the number of uh, decisions that a farmer has to make every year. So uh, ag tech can be very uh, fragment fragmented. And uh, that's where uh, collaboration and connectivity has to happen between the different uh, solution providers. And for example, at Geosys, we've developed a, a portfolio of uh, APIs that's easy to use and integrate so that uh, not all of the ag tech uh, provider have to develop their own um, remote sensing uh, integration system. And so that we can uh, concentrate on our each of us on our core business and collaborate through uh, APIs. That's becoming more and more common so that at the end of the day, there, there is a, a one comprehensive solution that is provided to the farmer and that integrates all of that technology. Extremely important. Um, can you, yeah, is, is there, so there's basically, there's some standardized ways for, for people to consume data so you don't have to develop an entirely new program. That's becoming more prevalent. I'll ask uh, Mitch, Mitch that question. Mitch, go ahead. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, Michael, is the power of economics take hold, right? And so to Allison's point, where, where economies are efficient, where there's opportunity to be created, i.e. margin, integrations, partnerships, collaborations will happen. And we, we, saw it, we saw it earlier this year coming out of the pandemic Pepsi and Beyond Meat announcing a partnership, right? I mean, this is one of those things that you, you sort of scratch your head out at first blush, but it's a powerful, it's a powerful view of new partnerships will be created, new ways in which innovation will take place will happen out of existential reality, right? How, how do we make this system more efficient? Beyond Meat and Pepsi come together because Pepsi already has a connection to the retail marketplace. And I think as we look at the role of tech, SaaS, let's be really clear, software as a service and as it relates to the broader food system, where we have to be, where we have to drive innovation. All of us here on this call, all of us within this industry is to say, how do we create something that is accretive to all of those within the supply chain? It's so easy to say, okay, let's let's optimize at the at the farm gate. Let's optimize at the the feedlot. And I think that's really really important. But when innovation happens, when software when innovation takes place, where is that margin accretive? If the margin is accretive to the producer, to Allison's point, you're going to see adoption. But if that margin is accretive somewhere between you know post production and storefront, then you know, economies and interests aren't necessarily aligned. And I think that's really going to be this next chapter is where we're going to see the power of the economy, the power of eco economics take hold and say, okay, look, there is, there's opportunity for us to reimagine what this looks like and how does everyone benefit? Not it go to a wholesale level or a retail level or to a production level, but how does it get accretive across the entire system? That's where magic's going to happen. Yeah, that's uh, that's only kind of the biggest the biggest uh, uh, issue there is to to get some of that profits flowing downstream. Um. I got a little bit excited now when Mitch uh, mentioned innovation, so I get into it. But like we have been in a position uh, or positioning solutions for like twenty five years, uh, and that's primary to optimize the field and. Um, 
I think we have around uh, 8 billion hectares that is with Hexagon Tech in motion on this. So it's it's great. But I was just thinking through the rest of the audience here and all the team members on the call, like how many are now exposed more to the innovation on the biotech side? Because that, I think, is an area that is rising fast too. We're talking a lot about optimizing the efficiency on the field. But here it would be interesting, maybe from other team members here can explain a little bit how you do with biotech. We are only in the early, early stages on investing in interesting potential startups from an R-evolution perspective. Uh, but maybe you guys have already gone a little bit further. Anyone, it looks like Allison wants to jump in on that. Yeah, I'm happy to talk. So we do a little bit of work on the genetic side um, and it's, it's, it's super fascinating, right? So uh, in the indoor ag industry in particular, it's a really fascinating space because indoor ag has served maybe two purposes in the past, right? One was for breeding technology, just to have a more enclosed environment. And then the second is production level uh, for mostly vine crops um, throughout throughout Europe and in Canada. Um, it's now starting to come into a full production cycle, right? Where we're doing more different types of crops. We're doing this at scale. We're having acreage sort of expand as, as quickly as we can. Um, but it creates a unique opportunity, Eric, to your point, um, because we're still using genetics from field ag. Um, and so we haven't actually adapted to the new environment of growing indoors uh, with new genetics. So it's one of the few spaces where there's a complete greenfield opportunity to rebuild a genetics library around what it means to grow in a controlled environment ag where you have artificial lighting and you have uh, hydroponic growing systems potentially and you have all of these different types of opportunities. Um, and so we're doing a ton of work with some of the genetics companies right now on how we can use uh, artificial intelligence and computer vision and uh, and various software technologies and machine learning to either accelerate uh, the breeding process for that uh, or to hyper tailor to environments right to get it to a place where it's actually deployable at scale in various environments which I think is really really exciting um, and that can be seen not just on the genetic side but across the entire biotech spectrum, right? You can do this on inputs. You can do this on different growing media. You can do this on fertilizer. You can do it on uh, integrated pest management or biologicals. You can do it on uh, fertilizer. So there's there's a whole area of input world that is seeing sort of a, a multi-billion dollar market arise for the first time in the CEA space, which creates an opportunity for technology companies uh, like what we're doing at UNU, but for plenty of other, other companies uh, to come in and to work with those companies to help see what, what happens in an R&D facility and how do you take that to scale in a brand new market. That, that sort of dovetails nicely into our, our next topic, which is how climate change is exacerbating sort of food availability and the food crisis. Does um, is, is anyone like to, to, to delve into that topic? Um, coming off a year of a pretty extreme drought in part of, part of the world and, and abundant extreme rain elsewhere. Um, anyone? Cecile. Yes, I think the, the risk of uh, food uh, crisis is, is there today. Uh, although we've seen uh, areas of uh, crops and yields increasing the last years, if we take uh, uh, it uh, globally, so at the world scale. So uh, we've been quite lucky not to see any big uh, food crisis at the global scale, because most of the time when there's something happening in Australia, for example, with a drought, uh, so the production of wheat uh, in Australia might be uh, decreasing a lot. It's usually balanced uh, by other places like Russia and Ukraine uh, that uh, grow uh, wheat as well. And uh, so most of the time we, we've been quite lucky to see a kind of uh, balance between the different areas of the world. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the risk is there today. That's where uh, we need an early warning system to observe what's happening at uh, every places of the world, and then uh, take uh, actionable uh, actions, uh, both from a, a government perspective, but as well from a, a grain trading, for example, perspective, to uh, take uh, the actions that's needed uh, at the time it's needed. So to that extent, uh, global monitoring system and satellite imagery can enable that uh, in combination with uh, weather data is essential to observe what's happening at the global scale, at the world scale. Thanks, that's a really good 
point, you know, wheat yields in particular can be quite uh, volatile and, and, you know, sometimes the longer growing season that someone might associate with climate change can actually boost wheat yields, um, which is something that not everyone realizes. Uh, Lindsay, would you like to jump in here? Yeah, it was really just to sort of add the tail end to what Cecile was saying. I agree with all of that. The the, the prediction systems, <clears throat> health observation included, are going to be increasingly important in being able to mitigate the risk. And it's going to be, unfortunately, an increasing amount of volatility and risk associated with this. But I think in tandem with that, supply chains are going to have to be smarter about from whom they're able to procure and, and maintain supply security um, right around the world. So those supply chains are going to have to be more nimble, but also more intelligent and more informed about the provenance of what is being grown, where and how, so that they can not only keep you know the factories rolling in the food production sense, um, but, but also satisfy ultimately the consumers that, that, that what is being provided on the supermarket shelves does not dip in quality regardless of volatility and supply wherever it might be you know and we had a we had a case in the UK where we had a bit of a pasta shortage for a while you know because of droughts in Canada so we we work you know we're living in an interconnected world and 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 being able to use data and and and, and connectivity and prediction systems as Cecile was talking about um, going to be increasingly important for us to be able to maintain supply Lice. Do you want to jump in there? Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, we know that uh, to balance productivity and uh, greenhouse emissions, that's a challenge for the future, but also adaptation resilience, mainly for smallholder farmers, that's also a challenge. Uh, with the conventional agriculture, uh, sometimes it's not affordable for smaller agricultures to own the machinery, to buy all the products, pesticides, fertilizers. So they need uh, more affordable technologies uh, so they can adapt and then have a sustainable way of farming. So that's something we are also looking for. And a lot of startups are, are starting to look for more transformational uh, solutions. And that's something we will need. We need to look after those smaller farmers and, and provide that to them. Uh, and also when we think about mainly here in Brazil and protecting the Amazon forest, we don't have uh, more land to expand uh, for agriculture, even though we have a productivity challenge. So having higher yields in the same acre is a challenge as well. Um, and with data, with uh, our AI platform, we are also looking to address that uh, challenge. So we've, we've talked a lot here about getting more efficient, efficient uh, optimizing all the inputs, all the resources, but productivity and adaptation are two other really important pillars we need to pursue with the technology. And at least here in Brazil, when we talk about row crops, which is one of the largest industries here, 80% of that industry here are owned by medium and smaller farmers. So solutions for them are really important if we need to make a dramatic change in how we produce food. Uh, so that's something we want to partner together in the sector and advance in our expansion through our technology uh, to solve that challenge for the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, whether it's a lack of new equipment or internet connectivity or the availability of farm workers, what what are some of the other pressure points um, that that you all see from, you know, becoming more green or becoming more technolo technological uh, on the farm? Where are the pressure points, Allison? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big ones is that we have an aging farmer population, right? And so if you think about the big one of the biggest hurdles of moving forward technologically, uh, there's this this syndrome I think we probably all know in this industry that is, well, I've done this for forever, so why why change, right? And that's not in everybody's head, of course. Most farmers, in fact, are very much looking towards the future, but there's there's a huge sort of hurdle when you have a population that is 55 and older, uh, sort of as the average age in the United States and even older in other countries like Japan, where you have this, uh, this sort of hurdle of how do we have, do we have to wait for a generational shift? 
or can we steer through and leapfrog technologies now? Um, and so that I think is a huge hurdle. Um, a, a second would be just the land sort of changing dynamics, right? We talked a little bit about this, but it, when you think about climate change, what is it doing? Well, it's physically impacting the land we have available to us to grow. It creates drought, it creates changing dynamics for soil. Um, and so we're going to have to shift the mindset entirely systemically of what it means to actually grow food in in the various countries where we're being impacted heavily by this. And so that's where you start thinking about, um, you know, not just small changes like recommending a change to, to my irrigation or recommending changes to fertilizer, which is super important, right? It has to be done. But then you start thinking of, well, what's a 10x change? Like, what's the thing that changes dynamically? If we don't have land available to us today, um, the same land that we have available to us today in 10 years, how do we grow in new, entirely new systems to address that need, right? And how do we do that in a way that is sustainable and addresses the labor shortage and addresses the research shortage and addresses the supply chain issues and addresses the pricing dynamics, right? Like one of the big questions of this is who's all paying for this? Is it farmers? Because it's not going to happen. Uh, they don't have the margin to pay for changing their entire system. Uh, is it consumers? It's not going to happen. If you look at why consumers buy things, they buy on price first. Uh, second is probably freshness and produce at least, right? And so, uh, and flavor. And so who, who's paying for this, right? Is it the big ag companies? No, probably not. Uh, is it CPGs? Probably not. So we have to think about like how these shifts are going to happen um, because that's a big question too of who's going to pay for this. Um, who's leading the charge, right? If I, if my motivation is I only plant once a season and I've got three more seasons left in me or four more seasons left in me, it's not me. Um, and so, uh, we have to think about like an entire systemic change and who's driving it. Uh, technology companies will be there. We're going to be there. We're going to steer some of it. Um, but we're also not the ones making prime decisions on this. That's a really good point. Looks like uh, lots of folks want to want to jump in here. Um, how about Jocelyn? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, very good, very good point. And uh, I think if we look at pressure point, I think it's uh, well, let's not say that it's uh, pretty good. There's there's multiple, and it's it's very complex. I think I think there are ways though, and uh, again, you know the the, the magnitude of changes. Has to be important, but I think uh, myself, you know, I am a believer in uh, in uh, taking the first step and taking the next step, you know, and uh, and having that direction and the vision of uh, you know getting in the right direction. And I think there's there's a few things, especially when you think about water, uh, you can create those situations where everybody wins: the community, the farmers, the the suppliers, uh, technology suppliers like us. Uh, there's there's very few uh, water suppliers, mostly utilities and uh, and, uh, and government entities. But still, uh, you can, you can create a situation where where you use water more efficiently, you boost productivity, uh, and things along those lines. But the, the pressure points are, are are pretty obvious for the farmers. I think water scarcity, uh, you know, pollution, and then a non-point source way, you know, so you're, you're polluting, but it's diffuse. It's not a one thing, one thing specifically that you can do about it. I mean, it affects the communities around you. So the, the, the pressure is there definitely. So I think, I think as we integrate data, as we generate better data, uh, you know, getting, giving farmers more predictability, more repeatability and, uh, and in changing conditions and uh, giving them a way to uh, produce more with less. Uh, we cannot, I don't think we can keep expanding farm land, but we need to produce more food. Uh, indoor farming is one of the solutions, of course, is it, uh, some, some crops. I don't think you can replace in the short run the full uh, food system or production system with it. So it's a combination at the end of the day. But uh, it's going to be interesting because I agree there's no clear cut for every. For some part of the problem, there's no clean uh, answer on who's paying for it and who is benefiting from it. And uh, yeah, I don't have the answers, but the the the, the angle should that, that should definitely be looked at, especially in the context of uh, COP26 and uh, those uh, global conferences. Yeah, as we sort of start to uh, start to wrap up the session, we did want to weigh in on COP26 and if there was anything that anyone wanted to raise or saw specifically, or if you had sort of ideas about what goals might be set there that, that could start to change agriculture. Um, does anything sort of come to mind there? 
Eric? It's partly showing in to Alison and Jocelyn discussion there regarding the economics. Time will take the decision for us if we don't act now. And I think that is what COP26 will be a reminder of, that uh, if we don't act, Earth will tell us to act because we need to do more with less. So what happens now in the next coming 10 years will define how our planet can look like. So from a business perspective, it will be very lucrative to get clean water, get good crop. So the willingness to pay will be there, but it will be at the cost for a lot of others that maybe doesn't have the capability to get this if we don't do more with less. So you have to connect a little bit how I started. Like if we have this 10 or maybe 100 times more data, we should be 10 or 100 times more efficient. And the catch-up effect is happening now. And we will experience it now. During the next coming five years, I'm 100% confident it's going to be an explosion with innovation and the willingness to make this happen because we don't have any other choice. Time will be the decision for us. And are we sort of catching up with efficiencies before the need comes? Or do you think the need is, is going to be there before the sort of industry is, is able to meet it? I guess that's, that's the eternal debate. Um, Cecile? Yes, I think uh, the COP26 has reaffirmed the, the goal towards uh, zero net emission by 2050. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, there is a shift where farmers and agriculture in general was seen as an emitter of uh, carbon. And now there's a mindset shift towards uh, seeing agriculture as part of the solution towards this goal. And uh, uh, there, there is more and more recognition that sustainable practices can sequestrate more carbon. And to come back to Alison's point on uh, who's going to pay for the shift, there are more and more uh, voluntary marketplaces of carbon offset credits that are being put in place. And uh, that's going to be enabled by uh, Actec, you know, with uh, those platforms to, to exist. And for uh, the, the, the eligibility of the farmers and for the monitoring of the impact of sustainable practices to be measured, uh, the role of Actec is going to be crucial. Yeah, we do know that, you know, some farmers are already getting paid for the carbon sequestration and there's companies paying them. And then some of the CPG uh, consumer packaged good companies also they're they're buying the credits. Um, so that's that's been uh, very interesting to see. Uh, Lindsay, yeah, thanks. I, I I just wanted to add that I think I mean the I think I read this morning there's still some calls from major investors into um, you know getting the G20 nations to come up with some agriculture specific reduction targets and there's some general. Um, reduction targets which have been stated, but, but not ag industry specific. And, and I think that would help. And, uh, and also, also, you know, back to this question about who pays, I mean, there are a whole range of practices, even, even, you know, even before we get into emerging carbon trading schemes and, you know, discussions about whether or not some of that can be fully proven and not greenwashing and all the rest of it, there are some production practices which can be encouraged at large scale but I, I feel that's that's a major role for government there to come in and intervene and really help farmers, um, it, you know, in, in various places around the world, be able to do some of this stuff and make some of these changes and, and actually work perhaps in, in, in many instances um, in, in tandem with the ag tech industry to, to, to really help get this ball rolling, you know, um, whether that's, you yeah. know, Farmers approaching retirement or not, it's it, it, it's something which I think if we have, if we have these agriculture specific targets that governments help to set, then it's against those targets that we can start coming up with the KPIs and the and and, and, and answer some of the questions as to how do we deliver these, how do we help farmers do this in a in a way that's not going to destroy their businesses. So I think all that's quite important as well. We, we, we really got to look to governments as well to come in and help. Well, we've just about run out of time. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who uh, participated today. Uh, we'll send out a highlight article when it's completed.
and just wanted to spend uh, a special thanks to the sponsor IEDC. And um, I'm not sure if, if Mitch had some, some closing comments. Michael, thank you. Thanks to the entire team here for a great conversation today. Look forward to many more in the future and look forward to staying in touch to say how we can be a part of the broader global solution here in Indiana.